Okay, okay, willkommen zurück zu diesem äh, zweiten Teil des Zweiteilers, äh, wo wir, vielleicht wird es sogar ein Dreiteiler, ich meine das Video dauert eine Stunde, wir sind erst eine Viertelstunde in, äh, 50, äh, <coughs> 35 C3, oh mein Gott, Dead Zungenbrecher für meine Sprachbehinderung, 35 C3, Wallet.fail. Ähm, von ich habe schon wieder vergessen von dem der Talk ist aber es ist auf jeden Fall auf dem offiziellen Media CCC.de Channel ähm, genau wir sind hier auf Laser gucken werden mit der IP 149.202.127.134 und das ist sozusagen der zweite Teil eines Zweiteilers also schaut die Folge was war es 52 an für die ersten 14 Minuten ähm, genau ja alternativ äh, kann man auch auf diesem Minecraft Server mit der Domain silihum.com connecten Let's go. And here I actually got a little bit nervous because it wasn't working. And so it wasn't working. I was like, how many FPS sind wieder stabil. Ah, don't worry, it's only Linux. So it just doesn't work on Linux. So that was no problem. I did this on Windows and it's no problem. It's the device and chain one. I was able to move on. So the thing is, this is a very crude receiver, but the attacker can always use more power. So here I have, this is my antenna set up in the basement. And with a 50 watt transmitter, I could remotely trigger the button at 11 meters. And at this point, I'm just limited by my basement size. I'm pretty, I'm very confident that I'd be able to remotely trigger this thing further. Um, yeah. So uh, here we're going to see a demo of what it looks like. And so the other problem you have with hardware implants is how do you know you have the implanted device? So you have to label it some way. Ledger has this kind of Latin phrase that scrolls. Uh, I wanted my own Latin phrase. And so this is how I know this is my implanted device. So what you're going to see is that the transaction screen is going to show up. This is, and I'm and basically I'm going to trigger this remotely. So I'm going to show the radio come in, and then it's going to approve the transaction without any hands. So this is the transaction. There's the screen going. This is what you're supposed to verify. There's the radio coming in, 433 megahertz, and then it's going to proceed to the next screen without me touching the button. There you go. So this is remotely triggered, and that would have sent the transaction. So if you think about the context that you have a malicious software implant that sent it to a wrong address, the attacker now can remotely accept that and bypass the security level. Oh, wenn hier schon Kühe sind, dann kann man die fast mitnehmen, oder? Was so sagt yeah, ihr? Security is over. Stickers are for laptops, not for security. Supply chain attacks are, are very easy to do uh, at a hardware level, but they're quite hard to do at scale. And uh, the vendor says that they're different things. So. Yeah, um, Introducing uh, the boot bay vulnerability. It's a bootloader vulnerability in the Ledger Nano S. We did not come up with this constant. It's literally in the code, as we'll see later. So uh, the name was not ours, but we like it. So we also bought the domain bootbay.be. The Ledger Nano S is a very simple wallet. It simply has a small display, it has a USB port, and two buttons. That's really all there is. And If you take it apart, you see it's just uh, some pieces of plastic, the display, and the PCB. And looking at the PCB, it kind of has an interesting architecture where you have an STM32, which is, is just a general purpose microcontroller, and an ST31, which is a secret element that is, for example, used in pay TV and so on. And it's regarded as a very high security um, chip, basically. And if you turn the PCB around, you see that they were nice enough to leave the programming mm. port for the STM32 open to us, enabled. And this has been suspected by other people, we verified it, but you know, you have to go through it. And obviously, Ledger is aware of this. And so let's look at the security model that the Ledger Nano S has. The basic idea is that if, if we look at this device, we, we kind of have this schematic of the STM32 uh, being on the left and the ST31 on the right. And as you can see, all peripherals are connected to the STM32. 
That is because the ST31 does not have enough pins to connect peripherals. It literally only has a one pin interface, uh, which is for the smart card protocols basically. And so all the heavy lifting is done by the STM32. And Ledger splits this up into the unsecure part and the secure part. And the idea is that the STM32 acts as a proxy. So it's basically the hardware driver for the button, for the display, for the USB, similar to a North Bridge in your standard computer. And when you take a computer and want to make a transaction, you create your transaction on the computer, it goes through USB to the STM32, and the STM32 then forwards it to the ST31. The ST31 then says, oh, a new transaction, I want to ask the user to confirm it. So it sends a display command to the STM32, which in turn displays it on the screen. And then you press the yes button, again, it goes the same route to the ST31, which then eternally signs the transaction, so this never leaves the device. And our signed transaction goes back through the STM, through USB, to the computer. To us, this means if this chip is compromised, we can send malicious transactions to the ST31 and confirm them ourselves. Or we can even go and show a different transaction on the screen than we're actually sending to the ST31. And Ledger is aware of this and we'll talk about how they try to mitigate this later. But first we have to find an exploit because while we do have debugging access to the chip, hardware access is sometimes kind of buggy, no offense. <laughs> So we, we wanted to have a, a software bug, and so we started Bro. reverse engineering the firmware upgrade process. And when you look at the, uh, at the bootloader, the bootloader for the ledger used to be open source, and back then they didn't have any verification of the firmware. So if you, you could basically boot the device into bootloader mode, flash whatever firmware you want, and then it would run it. After someone, Salim in this case, wrote about this, they changed it, and they changed it to do some cryptographic measure, and we were too lazy to reverse engineer that cryptographic measure because it's very time consuming, very hard, so we looked more at the parts surrounding it and how we can maybe find a bug in the bootloader to break it. And it turns out that when you, when you, uh, when you try to up whoops, when you try to upgrade your ledger, you, it accepts four different commands. One is select segment, which allows you to select the address space at which your firmware will be flashed. One is the load command, which allows you to write data to flash. Then you have the flush command, which is basically like fsync on Linux and writes your changes to the non-volatile memory. And you have the boot command, which verifies the, flash co the flashed code and starts booting it. So to us, the boot command is the most interesting because it pr pr uh, provides all the verification Leute, and attempts to ensure that no malicious schießen. image is booted. And it turns out that if you issue the boot command, it compares the whole image to whatever cryptographical function they use. And if it's successfully verified, they write a constant to the address 0x800-3000. And that constant is footbase. And so to not have to verify the entire flash on each boot, they just do this once, so only after a firmware upgrade. So basically, if you boot up the ledger, it boots, it waits 500 milliseconds, it checks if you have a button pressed, if yes, it goes to bootloader, otherwise it lo loads the constant at 0x800-3000, and if it's food babe, it boots the firmware. So our goal is to write food babe to that address. <coughs> First attempt, we just issue a select segment command to exactly that address. We just write food babe to it, flush, and reset the device. Didn't work, unfortunately. So we had to do more reverse engineering. And it turns out that they use an interesting approach to ensure that you don't accidentally flash over the bootloader. So they basically blacklist the whole memory region. So if you try to flash from 0x800 4x0 up to 0x800 3000, it returns an error. If you try to directly write to Foodbabe, they thought about it and they have a very specific code path to prevent that. So they set it to zero and you're screwed again. And then finally it writes, assuming you didn't error out. But it turns out that the STM32 has kind of an interesting memory map. 
And on a lot of chips, you can not only map your flash to one address, but you can also have it uh, mapped to another address. And in this case, the flash is indeed also mapped to the address zero. And so the bootloader uses a blacklisting approach, so it only excludes certain memory areas. But it doesn't use whitelisting, where you could only explicitly write to this memory region. So they do not like writing to 0x0. Profit, second attempt. We just select the segment at 3000, which maps to 0x800, 3000. We write food back to it. We flush, reset, and we can flush custom firmware. Awesome. So. <laughs> What do you do when you have a device that where the display is not big enough to run Doom with a custom firmware? So in this case, it's an original ledger. Press the button, put it into bootloader mode, which is part of the normal operation, and... Snake. <laughs> nice. If you want to play a bit of Snake, come by later. So, <laughs> How are they protecting against this? I've mentioned before, Ledger is aware that you can reflash this STM32 and they, are, they put in some measures to prevent you doing malicious stuff. And basically what they do, and this is very simplified and we did not bother to fully reverse engineer it because we didn't need to basically. When, you, when the chip boots, it sends its entire firmware to the ST31, which then performs some kind of hashing or so, verifies that the firmware is authentic, and it also measures the time it takes to send the firmware. This is to prevent you from just running a compression algorithm on the STM32 and send it very slowly. How do we bypass this? So our idea was because we don't only have flash, we also have RAM. So what if we create a compromised and compressed firmware that copies itself to RAM, we jump to it, and then it writes its entire compressed firmware to flash, uncompressed in that case, and then we just call the original code on the CQ element. It will verify the firmware, it will run with the real timing, and boots up regularly. And so we attempted this. It took quite a, quite a while to achieve, because basically you can't do zip, you can't do LZMA, because even if you compress the image, you don't have enough space for a complex compressor. So you, our attempt was to find duplicate bytes, squeeze them together, and make space for our custom payload. And basically, we just have a table that says, OK, now you will have six zeros or something, and our each table entry only takes a single byte. So, ah, wie hieß and it's only like noch mal? ten instructions in a sampler to run this decompressor. So you don't have the large code base; it's very easy to use. And it turns out that even with a very das simple detector, Namen, this thing, oder? like in this case, we, we run the script to find the longest duplicate data, and you can see on the first try we get like 260 bytes of space for our payload, which is enough for a lot of things, let's say. And we have a working proof of concept of, of this, and we would go into a lot of details, but it would, we only got an hour. <laughs> and so we, we will release after this talk a non-offensive example of this that you can look at. How does it work? What can you do even if your firmware is uh, attempting to be verified? And we also, and this is very exciting, we're working with the YouTuber Life Overflow, and ah. he created a 20-minute video on walking through this entire food base vulnerability, how the verification works, and how to bypass it to a certain degree. We don't want to weaponize it, so we did not, we will not release the first, the, the full thing. But yeah, very excited for this. Stay tuned on our Twitter, and we'll link it for sure. As part of this, we also have a lot of software that we will release. So a public release will release the Snake firmware. So uh, hopefully this evening you'll be able to play Snake on your ledger. If you bought bit some Bitcoin at 20,000 and now are bankrupt, you can at least play Snake. We will open source the compressor and the extractor. We build a logic analyzer plugin for the smart card protocol, and we build a software that analyzes the communication between the STM32 and the ST31 
on the ledger specific data and you can just dump it. So if you guys are interested in, for example, trying to break into the ST31, please uh, have a go. And Ledger has a second device, uh, which is called the Ledger Blue. We assume the reason it's called the Ledger Blue is because it contains Bluetooth, but um, they never enable Bluetooth, so it's basically just a regular Ledger with a color display and a big battery in it. And we call this part Fantastic Signals and How to Find Them. Because when we open up this device and we were chatting, we have this nice Telegram chat room where we are chatting 24-7 while doing this. And we open up the device and the first thing, like literally five minutes after opening it, I saw that you have the CQ element on the left and the STM32 on the right. You have some other stuff like the Bluetooth module and so on. The trace between the secure element and the microcontroller is pretty long and contains a pretty fast signal. So what is a long conductor with a fast changing current? Anyone got a clue? Correct, it's an antenna. So I pu uh, pulled out my HackRF uh, software defined radio. This is just a very a more sophisticated RTL SCR, so you can just sniff arbitrary signals with it. I got a random shitty telescope antenna on Amazon, and I have my ledger blue. And so on this screen, you can see the blue thing is the radio spectrum around 169 megahertz. And if we start entering our pin, we can see that there's a weak signal. You guys see where this is going on the on the radio. Unfortunately, that signal is pretty weak. Luckily, they included an antenna. Like, they call it a USB cable, but I'm not so sure about it. So this time with USB connected, and we do the same thing again, you can see like crazy radio spikes. And this is right next to each other, but even if you go a couple of meters. I was limited as Josh by my uh, living room space. You get a couple of meters of decent reception. So our goal was to find out what is this signal. And if we just look at the recorded amplitude of the signal, we get this. And if you do a lot of probing and so on, you immediately see, okay, there are spikes and there are 11 of them, and then there's a pause, and then there's more spikes. So this is probably some kind of protocol mm -hmm. that first sends 11 bytes of data, then pauses, and then sends more data. So we looked at the back of the device, started probing every single <laughs> connection, and tried to figure out, is this the secure element? Is this whatever? And it turned out to be the display bus. So we can sniff information on what is sent to the display remotely. and. If, you, if we look at the signal that gets sent in blue, is the signal that gets sent when you press the letter zero on the pin pad, and in orange, when you press the letter seven. So we can see a very clear difference at certain points on the signal, which confirmed our suspicion. But building software for this is kind of boring, like digital signal processing is not really my thing, so what do we do? And we wanted to increase the buzzword load in our talk a bit, and so we are hacking blockchain IoT <laughs> devices <laughs> using artificial intelligence <laughs> in the cloud. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so our idea was we record training signals, we use some kind of pre-filtering, we train an AI on it, profit, literally. <laughs> Problem is, getting training data really sucks, because you don't want to sit there for 10 hours pressing the same key on a pin pad. It really doesn't sound like fun, and so this needs automation. So, <laughs> we took an Arduino, we took a roll of masking tape, a piece of acrylic glass, a PCB device, and this is a Huawei pen for the extra amount of Chinese backdoor. And we let this run for a couple of hours. And you can actually see oh my God, <laughs> that 
every time it presses down, you can see that the digit that you pressed is highlighted. And the difference in the signal we saw earlier is probably the X and Y coordinate of where it highlights the button. And that's the difference we can see in the, tra uh, in the, in the, in the trace. And so we had a lot of recorded data now. We created wow. training sets. We created a test set. Pre-processing, TensorFlow, AI model. It's really easy, surprisingly. <laughs> and we tried our test set, did a prediction. And so the big question, how accurate is it? And it turns out, so this is the, the result of a cut of the test set. And if we zoom in on this, this basically tells you we have the, the signal, this gray thing, it's just a picture representation of the signal. And it tells you how sure it is what digit it is. In this case, it's seven with 98% likelihood, so pretty good. In our test set, we only have one wrong result, and overall we get around 90% accuracy. And to move this in the cloud, we are hosting this on the Google Cloud as the Ledger AI for you guys to play with and we'll publish it online with a limited data set that is trained on a very close base. So you cannot do something super malicious with it, but it's nice to play around and see how this was done. And this brings us to the next part. Glitch me if you can. Thank you. So now we're going to talk about the silicon level vulnerability uh, with glitching attacks or projection. So to review, uh, we'll be talking about the Trezor 1. And so I just want to go over very quickly what the architecture is of the Trezor 1 and some previous work that it's done. So the Trezor 1 is a, a quite a simple embedded device. Uh, it consists of only a few components. Uh, it has a OLED display, it has some buttons, and has a USB connector that are all externally uh, facing. Internally, it has its, its main brain, if you will, is the FPM32 F205 microcontroller, uh, which controls all the other operations on the Trezor, the display, the USB, and the two buttons. So last year, we gave a talk uh, at DEF CON, uh, breaking Bitcoin hardware wallets. Here, we use the chip whisperer to mainly do the glitching attacks. The conclusions from uh, last year is that the F205 was vulnerable to fault injection, um, but we, it was inconclusive if we could do a uh, exploit via the fault. So this year we have a different result, uh, but the output of uh, that work was this board, what's called the Breaking Bitcoin board. Uh, basically, it was a Trezor clone that just made it easy to attach wires and probes. And so we made this board. Uh, the design schematics are all online. It's open source hardware. Now, this is the Chip Whisperer setup that we were using. So we made the board specifically to fit on the Chip Whisperer target board. And this is just uh, what it looks like when you use the Chip Whisperer GUI to perform a glitch. And here we were doing oh the pickaxe is so scheiße. Also, so it's very different. But uh, I gave that talk, and then I met to be Sick touch. Oh, I have no tricks, pickaxes. Ah. Yes. So fortunately, we had Josh to do the talk last year and to kind of exhaust a lot of the firmware vulnerabilities mm -hmm. that um, were actually hardware vulnerabilities in the firmware that might have been there. So we immediately knew that we could exclude this. And so you can start looking at the underlying microcontroller. So in this case, it's the STM32 microcontroller that they use inside of it, and it controls everything. So compromising the STM32 microcontroller means that you can compromise, uh, you can compromise the device. So uh, the, I mean, so there's a couple of papers uh, that have covered uh, some of the vulnerabilities in the STM32. Specifically, there's one which describes a UV attack, which lets you downgrade the security on the STM32s. So we determined that paper, unfortunately, does not apply to, to our result because the Trezor is smart enough when it boots to check the value stored in flash and if it has been altered in any way to set it correctly. So they actually even uh, protect it against this kind of attack. But nevertheless, uh, you can see that there's some vulnerabilities. So uh, there's another paper, which unfortunately uh, has not been published yet, and we couldn't get in touch with the authors yet, that should be coming out in January, hopefully, uh, which describes glitches against the STM32 F1 and the STM32 F3. So now we have the F0, the F1, and the F3. And so 
basically, here's the product matrix. So uh, three of them are already vulnerable. Uh, so, but we're looking at the STM32F2 and uh, potentially the STM32F4 if we're talking about the Trezor Model T. So those uh, we, we do not have vulnerabilities for yet. So uh, let's take a look at how, how it works really quickly. So the way that STM implements uh, security on the STM32 is that they store an option byte. And the option byte, the thing to remember is uh, on, on a Cortex M3 or M4 microcontroller, that you don't have anything other than flash. So even though they call it option byte or refer to this as fusing or being permanent in hardware, it's still stored in flash, just like the user application is stored in flash. So it's the same, exact same non-volatile memory that's otherwise used. So basically, the, when you get a new STM32, it's shipped in a state where you have full access. So that's how Josh was able to, to rework uh, a board and flash it with new firmware. Uh, and there's the, the ultimate security is what's called RDP2. So there you have no access. But you can see that uh, basically if you have a value other than AA or CC, which correspond to RDP0 and RDP2 uh, respectfully, um, then you have uh, what's wow. RDP1. Much more, right? much brain of where the cryptographic feed is stored on the Trezor. But it gives you access to RAM, it gives you access to the registers, uh, but it, it doesn't give you flash access, like I said, and it doesn't even give you single stepping as well. So connecting a debugger in this mode will actually cause the hardware to hard fall, which we'll see in a second. So uh, basically what we want to try to do is to downgrade RDP2, which is what the Trezor is set to, and we want to be able to access And so we did this completely in the dark over a, over three months, trying different parameters uh, on our on our glitch setups, which I'll show later. And we're able to find this, but I'm here to explain it to all of you so that it's easy to reproduce. So if you actually watch the STM32F2 boot, you'll see that it's relatively slow, and th it's only this slow after uh, you power cycle the board. So it takes approximately 1.8 uh, milliseconds to boot, which is uh, in microcontroller terms pretty slow. So you can see there's the power supply, there's the I.O. pin, and that's approximately how long it takes to boot the, the firmware. So you can see that's where the I.O. actually toggles, so 1.8 uh, milliseconds later. So we just wrote some firmware to uh, basically uh, turn, toggle one of the pins, measured it with an oscilloscope, now we have the timing of how long that takes. So that's not super interesting because that's not really uh, a trigger, and each one of these microcontrollers internally, it has a boot ROM, so it has uh, some, some ROM, read-only memory, right? It's not, not volatile memory, it's not the flash. It's literally a ROM which is inside the chip itself. It's, it's hard-coded, it cannot be fixed or patched, uh, that gets executed first. So we wanted to actually attack that because anything else is the user application, and that's what Josh did last year. So uh, you can kind of start to fiddle this down. So you, you see that 1.4 milliseconds of the reboot, nothing actually happens because this is now the reset line. And so the reset line goes high after 1.4 milliseconds. So you can ignore the first 1.4 milliseconds after you cycle the power. So now you, we, the next step that you can actually do is you can connect what's called a shunt resistor. So in the, uh, you, you, I mean, so oscilloscopes are there to measure voltage. And so you want to actually measure current to be able to know how much power consumption, uh, I mean, how much power is being consumed by the device. So you do what's called a shunt measurement. And that's what I have on this slide uh, right here. So you have uh, the blue signal is now actually the power consumption. And so now you can actually look and see what's happening. So the first thing that happens is uh, we have the execution of the boot ROM. So you can see the in the power consumption curve, you can clearly see this moment in time. Then you have uh, basically where uh, fl the flash and option bytes actually get read somewhat, uh, at least within the boot ROM. And finally, the third distinctive moment in time is where the application actually begins to execute. So now we've taken this 1.8 milliseconds, which is a relatively long time, and reduced it to 200 microseconds that we're actually interested in. And not only that, the, we know that we're actually interested in having slightly higher power consumption than the normal execution of the bootloader, or of the boot ROM rather. Uh, and this is uh, somewhere between, let's say, 170 microseconds and 200 microseconds. So this is the time at which we actually need to glitch. 
and this is also reasonable parameters if you're trying to reproduce this uh, at home. So what do you need to reproduce uh, this thing? So I, the greatest uh, thing that came out in the last couple of years is uh, the, these cheap Chinese power supplies where you take uh, a cheap uh, you know, old wall wart from one of your old Linksys routers, you plug it in, and then you actually have a controllable power supply with, uh, with a voltage and current, and you can adjust this and control this. Uh, and so that's what we're using here. Uh, the second thing that I have on the, I mean, the second thing that I have to actually control the timing is an FPGA. I mean, I use FPGAs for everything, and this is something that was easiest to put together with an FPGA because the FPGAs have uh, constant timing. So finally, we have a, a multiplexer um, uh, there as well, and the multiplexer is actually switching between two voltages between ground, so completely cutting the voltage off, and the normal operating voltage of the microcontroller. And finally, we have a debugger, the J-Link, uh, which is highly advised if you want to ever do JTAG stuff. Um, so it's just a, a JTAG debugger, and basically what happens is you let this run for a while, and it looks like this. It's not really uh, super, super eventful. So you can see that, that the voltage, uh, the yellow signal is actually the voltage, and you can see we're just dipping the voltage at different points in time, and simultaneously we have a Python script checking if we have JTAG access or not. And so pro tip to all the new dads, if you do this at home, you can turn your oscilloscope towards the door so that you, when you get up at night because the baby's crying, you can see if it's still running or not. So it's, it's very, it's highly advised. So now Thomas is gonna tell us how, how to get the seed into, into RAM. Okay. So we had this thing running for three months roughly across three continents because Josh is in America, Dimitri is in Russia and I'm in Germany and so it took us three months to get a successful glitch and even then we didn't believe it at first because we exhausted everything basically and the only reason we finally got it working is that we did a mistake where we mistook 70 microseconds with 170 <coughs> microseconds and had it run for a longer time and that's how we found out that the boot ROM is actually super slow to boot on this device. But and so once we had this downgrade from RDP2 to RDP1, we were able to uh, read the run, but we cannot read the flash, which actually contains the, the seed. And so how do we find this? And our idea was we start reviewing the upgrade procedure, because on the Trezor, the way the bootloader works is it doesn't require your pin or anything to upgrade the firmware, which makes sense, because let's say you have a bug in the pin function, you want to somehow be able to get rid of it, right? And the other thing is, if you flash a fully valid firmware, it retains the data, it retains your seed. If you flash uh, uh, a non-genuine one, it actually will erase your, your seed and so on. And, the big and they do a really good job on the firmware verification. We reviewed it for days and days and days and didn't find anything. But so how does this upgrade procedure work? How is the seed retained? And so when you review the, the relevant code, you see that there's a call to backup metadata, which sounds like it's going to uh, retain somehow your data. And indeed, you can see that it's literally a mem copy from the data on flash we're interested in into RAM. And so our basic procedure was we go into bootloader, we start a firmware upgrade, and we, s we stop it before the RAM gets cleared. Because if you finish the upgrade procedure, the Trezor actually clears its memory again, which is a very decent way to do it. But we found a way to retain it in RAM. So it turns out that when you start the firmware upgrade process, it eventually asks you to verify the checksum of what you just flashed. And it turns out that at this point in time, the seed is still in RAM and we can read it out via RDP2. And this is relatively simple, simple to you once you actually manage to glitch the device. You basically just run open OCD dump image, you get an image of the SRAM, and you have the whole RAM contents. And so, how? What are we going to do, Thomas? What are we going to do, Thomas? What, what high tech hacking tool will we be using today to extract the seed? So, we actually, before we were successful, we had hours of talks and how do we how is the seed stored and so on and we, but we found this super sophisticated seed extraction tool that only runs on POSIX and POSIX like systems 
it's called strings. I <laughs> And so basically, it turns out that when you have a firmware dump, as, as we, uh, if you have a RAM dump, as we do now, and we go to, we just run strings on the dump, we get a couple of really nice words. And I don't know if you remember the intro, mm. but this is your seat. Oh, nice. Does indeed minomics. Oh, that's so hard and to you smart. might be wondering what, th what this little number is. This is your pin to the. Device. Stark, direct darunter. That was a great day. <laughs> and so, Josh, or one of Josh's employees, uh, took all this mess we created on our desks and made it into this nice device, which is basically a socket where you put in your chip and then we can read out the seed and so on. Yeah, and so all of this stuff, including the board design, the FPGA code, so the Verilog code that we use, I mean, if somebody wants to, they can apply it and do the same thing with one of the ice sticks or one of the more open source friendly uh, FPGA boards. This just happens to be the one that we ha all had lying around uh, and, and could reproduce and work with. Uh, you can go ahead and do it. I mean, we suspect, uh, I think Thomas said, we suspect you might be able to do it with an Arduino as well because the, the actual glitch pulse is only approximately 60 uh, microseconds, or sorry, six, six microseconds in, in time. So it's a relatively slow signal as well. So it should be uh, relatively repeatable even with, even with something cheaper than this. But um, this w is a way to automate this even better and to not have dangling wires or any of the small soldering that was required to do it in situ in the device which we had on the previous slide. So all of that uh, we're going to have on GitHub. And so I think the, the final the final thing. One, one, one more thing uh, before we are sorry. <laughs> one more thing. So this breaks a lot of the, the Trezor security, but there is a way to protect your seat against this. So if you use a passphrase on your device, the way we understood it, it basically doesn't allow somebody with hardware access to steal all your funds. So if you add a passphrase to your Trezor, a good passphrase, and your machine is not already owned, you can somehow, you can somewhat pr uh, protect against this. But a lot of people don't, so we are really sorry. We didn't mean any harm. Um, I mean, yeah, that's uh, a <laughs> conclusion, I would, I would say. But. So, yeah, I mean, we, so all this stuff we're going to put online, uh, I guess I said, so you can follow us uh, for the links uh, on the, on, online. So wallet.fail, it's a domain name, if believe it or not, fail is a TLD. Uh, <laughs> so you can go to github.com, wallet.fail, twitter.com, wallet.fail. Uh, you can follow me, uh, Thomas, and Josh on, on Twitter as well. And like I said, we'll be releasing all this stuff, so it'll go up slowly just because uh, I think when we set out six months ago, we did not expect us to have 100% success in everything that we were planning to do. So that's yeah. a first for me, at the very least. The saddest part is that we have more vulnerabilities to other wallets, so but uh, only one hour. <laughs> And so we are also have some stuff to give out. So we have the hardware implant PCBs. We have a thousand of them if you want to get some. We Talk even to Josh. Yeah. We even have uh, components for them for like 100 devices. So hit us up and uh, we can do something. Thank you. I feel really inspired to break things apart in a very creative way. We have <laughs> no. some time left for questions, so if you have questions, please line up at the microphone. But first, we are going to start with a question from the internet. Thank you. I have lots of two related questions from the internet. First one, how come that you guys can't when Bitify announced that their Android-based wallet was unhackable? <laughs> and the second question, have you ever tried to attack the larger processor like so maybe let's start with Bitfi. So we only talk about somewhat secure wallets. We didn't want to use a Chinese phone in this talk. So uh, we laughed pretty hard and we ordered some, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, uh, this was covered extensively. So, so another guy who you should follow on Twitter, Cyber Gibbons, uh, gave a talk at hardware.io on, on the topic of the Bitfi. He 
he was summarizing research that he did in conjunction with a bunch of other people as well. So if you're interested in the BitFi, you should go look at them. So the second question was about uh, ARM-based uh, controllers. I mean, all of these were ARM-based. Uh, every single chip, as far as I know, that we looked at was was ARM-based in one way or another. Yeah, and that is so if you're interested in this, look at glitching the Nintendo Switch, where they glitch the Tegra used in the Nintendo Switch, which is very interesting and will give a lot of inspiration in, in that regard, basically. Thank you. A question for microphone four, please. Macht er gerade Eigenwerbung in der Frage? Ich verstehe echt akustisch kaum was, aber hat er gerade eiskalt fett Eigenwerbung gemacht? I mean, so we already covered uh, 
how the Trezor works. So there is only one chip, and it's the SDM32. So I know that there was a known issue with the Trezor back in the day where they weren't seeding uh, the, the basically the RNG correctly, um, but this was fixed. Uh, but for our attacks, this wasn't this wasn't an issue. I mean, if you were concerned about uh, how strong these are, how strong the random number generators are for creating a seed, you could actually create a BIP39 wallet outside of, of any one of these and then just use them for, for their hardware features and, yep. I mean, get, get, get the seed from outside. And if you have a question, please to the microphone if you're able to. But first, we have another question from the internet. Thank you. Uh, did you guys think it turns out when you had hip hop zero wallet? <laughs> no, but if you send it to us, we are happy to look at the Dino okay. sound. Oh, you did? Yeah, we had uh, oh. Ich habe nämlich das Gefühl, dass meine Rüstung hier unten noch kaputt geht. Okay, ja, das äh, war dann hier äh, der Chaos Computer Club 35C3, ähm, genau, mit wallet.fail. Äh, ja, das ist es dann auch mit dieser Episode hier auf dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft Server Laser Gurken Land ähm, unter der IP 149.202.127.134, alternativ unter der Domain sedihun.com. Sedihun.com. Ähm, ja, wir sehen uns in der nächsten äh, Folge dieser Dauerwerbesendung. Ja. <lacht>